Allahu barakatuh. Good morning. Um, good evening, everyone joining us today, whether you're um, calling in from uh, the United States or Sudan. Uh, I'm Akram Ahmed, one of the general surgeons here in Minnesota and uh, the director of the Career Development and Research Office in the Sudanese American Physician Association uh, here in Sudan. And we are pleased um, to um, start this session that is organizing collaboration with the Sudanese uh, Surgical Club, um, a great activity that is uh, involved in uh, thorough education and uh, continuous lectures and sessions for the surgical trainees back home in Sudan uh, that is gaining wider and wider um, uh, reputation. Uh, today, uh, we have a very important surgical topic um, which uh, will be conducted by a, uh, one of our um, experts in this topic here uh, in SAPA. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about bile duct injury following cholecystectomy. And uh, today I'm pleased to uh, welcome my speaker, uh, Dr. Mohamed Akod, who is the Chair Department of Transplantation and Hepatobiliary Disease in the Leahy Hospital Medical Center here in Massachusetts, United States. Um, Mr. Akod, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, please just remember to um, unmute yourself and uh, we can move on to the session. Um, just before we start, uh, a reminder for everybody that we're going to leave the question to the end of the session. Uh, we're going to um, have two way to post questions, either written in using the Q&A functionality at the bottom of the screen, or you can uh, ask for opportunity by using the raise hand functionality uh, that appears on the right side of the screen. And that way um, I can um, give you an opportunity at the end to ask questions. Again, going back to um, Dr. Mohamed Akkod, uh, I'll give the mic to you and uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Akram. Uh, and uh, I want to thank the uh, Sudan Surgical uh, Club for uh, giving us the opportunity to give this talk. Um, uh, I also want to thank Akram for his um, diligence and, um, and persistence. Um, he, in the surgical uh, group, um, the group of surgeons here in the United States, uh, he's the most active and, and persists and persistent and insistent. Um, uh, so uh, I, I really admire his um, commitment. Uh, I wanted to talk about bile duct injuries after uh, cholecystectomies. Um, uh, it's great to see Omar and um, Walid um, in the audience and, and many others. Um, I actually have seen bad duct injuries, not only here in the United States, but, um, but in Sudan as well. Um, so um, I think this is a, an, an important bread and butter uh, topic that um, we can uh, talk about. Um, so uh, Akram, is the slide uh, presentation going fine? Yes, we can see it, go ahead. Okay, all right. So, uh, how do I, uh, okay. Okay, so the um, talk I'm going to go over an overview of the laparoscopic cholecystectomy and bile duct injury, biliary anatomy, and mechanisms and classification um, of the bile duct injuries uh, management and uh, some talk about uh, prevention. Um, we all know, um, you guys are all surgeons, you know the advantages of minimally invasive approach um, with reduced hospitalizations. In the past, patients used to stay in the hospital for seven days for cholecystectomy. Now it's a, an outpatient procedure, improved recovery time, patients go back to work within a couple of weeks, uh, decreased uh, postoperative pain. Uh, we know the improved cosmesis with these little incisions rather than a big right uh, subcostal incision and uh, obviously reduced cost with uh, reduced hospitalizations. Uh, cholecystectomy is one of the most commonly performed surgical procedures in the world. Um, the reported incidence of bile duct injury in many reports is uh, one in 100 to one in 500 and that's really still very high. Um, only 25% are identified at surgery, and uh, it's aggravated by the delay in diagnosis, and, and injury can change the life of um, the patient. 
It is estimated that 35%, that's one in three sur general surgeons will encounter bile duct injury during their career. So uh, it, it has very serious uh, consequences uh, and serious complications if, they are, if bile duct injury is managed inadequately. It can result in life-threatening complications such as uh, cholangitis, uh, secondary biliary cirrhosis, and even portal hypertension. Sometimes even with successful management, the quality of life uh, of the patients may be uh, diminished. I'm actually following a patient who had bile duct injury 20 years ago and uh, keeps getting admitted with uh, uh, biliary strictures and, um, and jaundice. Uh, I just wanted to say that even extraordinarily talented surgeons can and will incur bile duct injury during laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Um, incurring a bile duct injury does not mean that you are a bad surgeon. Um, despite the increasing experience and progress in laparoscopic skills of surgeons with simulation and, and, and everything and education, the incidence of bile duct injury remains still high. Now, it is important to recognize that it is how you manage the expectations in the preoperative and how you respond to the event intraoperatively and postoperatively that will determine the patient's outcome. Um, some of the risk factors for bile duct injury include the surgeon experience, um, uh, um, the patient's obesity, uh, acute and chronic inflammation, bleeding, encountered during cholecystectomy, pancreatitis, and Meritzi syndrome, which is a large gallstone that, that, that uh, results in um, infusion of the uh, cystic duct to the um, common bile duct, and some variant bile duct anatomy, which um, I'll talk about. This is the, um, the typical anatomy of the um, biliary system. Uh, with the right uh, hepatic artery running uh, behind uh, posterior to the common bile duct and giving the cystic artery. Um, but there are many variations to that anatomy with uh, low union of the um, common hepatic duct, uh, adherence of the common bile duct to the uh, cystic duct. Uh, there's a high union and sometimes the cystic duct is absent, and sometimes it spirals and joins the, the common or hepatic duct um, on the left side. Um, this is uh, uh, also a, a variation in the anatomy with a, an accessory duct. You can see this accessory duct that can sometimes be um, injured during um, uh, cholecystectomy and can result in... Um, some uh, complications afterwards. Uh, this duct, I will talk about it later, but um, this is a variation of the anatomy that, uh, that you should be aware of, that there is, an ex there is sometimes an accessory duct uh, that, that can be injured during uh, cholecystectomy. Now, uh, going back to the risk factors and uh, mechanisms of injury, the, the anatomic factors with biliary and vascular um, abnormalities, Bleeding encounter during cholecystectomy appears to be one of the most common causes of bile duct injury. Scarring and obesity, uh, some are related to laparoscopic factors with um, lack of depth perception. And of course, it's not like when you're operating um, open where you have tactile feedback. The full manual maneuverability is when you are able, well, you're not able to move the gallbladder sideways to uh, be able to separate it. And I have to mention the lack of conversion to open cholecystectomy during difficult cases. Um, the surgeon experience we talked about and the anatomic misidentification ca that can result in injuries to the common bile duct, the common hepatic duct, the right and left hepatic ducts, um, the artery can be injured. Sometimes thermal injury can, uh, from the electrocautery can result in a stricture of the common bile duct or hepatic ducts. Now, the, uh, I don't know, many of you might be familiar with this society, the Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeon, the SAGES. Um, uh, the society um, created this uh, safety in cholecystectomy task force 
and uh, launched uh, an educational uh, program curriculum. It's actually available online and, and you can watch uh, various uh, videos um, and educational materials about it. So in 2014, uh, they um, launched a program to reduce the bile duct injury. And their um, statement was that sages seek to create a universal culture of safety in cholecystectomy by educating residents, fellows, and practicing surgeons about technical steps to prevent bile duct injuries, such as the critical view of safety and intraoperative biliary imaging. I encourage you to visit their website. There's a lot of uh, educational material um, about um, ways to. Um, to prevent uh, iatrogenic bile duct injury. So the SAFE uh, cholecystectomy task force, an expert consensus study was conducted to identify factors considered most important to reach uh, this goal. The following top five uh, important factors linked to SAFE practice, establishing the critical view of safety, understanding the relevant anatomy, appropriate retraction and exposure and knowing when to call for help and recognizing the need for conversion or an alternate procedure such as uh, subtural cholecystectomy. This is the critical view of safety that they're talking about and a lot of you might be familiar with it, um, but um, just to reiterate, it's with the gallbladder, the cystic duct, cystic artery and nothing in between. Uh, that's what what you're looking for when you're doing the laparoscopic cholecystectomy, retraction of the uh, infundibulum laterally. And this is the critical view of safety. There's nothing here other than the artery and the, um, and the bile duct. As I will show you in one of the videos, uh, sometimes you think that you um, have the critical view of safety, but you don't. Uh, this is a video, if I can have it work. Uh, that shows, this is a clean, obviously, cholecystectomy that shows the critical view of safety. The cystic duct uh, is clearly is isolated and dissected, the artery, and there's nothing, nothing else there. So it is recommended that you establish the critical view of safety before you clip anything. The methods to identify the cystic uh, duct during cholecystectomy include the uh, routine cholangiography, but that's controversial uh, nowadays. Uh, the critical view technique, the infundibular technique is basically following the cystic duct all the way up to the infundibulum before you um, uh, clip the common bile duct. Dissection at the cystic common bile duct junction has been mentioned by some um, some surgeons, um, but might be um, uh, risky. Intraoperative cholangiogram has been talked about a lot. Um, it might help in defining the anatomy. It has its technical limitations, and many of you might have tried to do uh, intraoperative cholangiogram, and you realize there are some technical difficulties. The pictures don't look right. Uh, moreover, the injury might have occurred prior to intraoperative cholangiogram. And uh, evidence supporting the routine versus selective uh, use is, is, is uh, conflicting. But there are some recommendations that I will go over um, from the SAGES task force at the end of the talk. At this point, intraoperative cholangiogram is not considered the standard of care. This is the classification, uh, the steward way classification of bile duct injuries uh, with uh, class one is injury to the bile duct below the insertion of the cystic duct. This is the common bile duct. Above the insertion of the um, cystic duct is the hepatic duct, the common hepatic duct. And that, if you encounter injury there, they classify that as class two. Class three is when the whole bile duct is um, transected and class four when there is um, injury to the right hepatic duct and artery. 
this how this is how injuries occur. This illustration it shows you that the common bile duct is more commonly injured because it's mistaken as the cystic duct. And when that happens, um, while removing the gallbladder, the right hepatic artery can be uh, injured as well. This is the classic uh, laparoscopic uh, bile duct injury is mistaking the common bile duct for the cystic duct. Um, you see, this is the Calo triangle here. Um, the gallbladder is retracted. Uh, the common bile duct is mistaken as the cystic duct. It's clipped and then um, taking the gallbladder out, the proximal bile duct is uh, injured. So what to do if um, injury is recognized intraoperatively? I always say this, uh, remain calm. I know it's easier said than done, but the, the reality is you have a patient under anesthesia. Uh, you have a family outside waiting for this patient. And what you decide to do at that point is um, going to determine the outcome of this patient and maybe maybe impact their quality of life or even um, their life. So it's important to, um, to remain calm, maybe go outside and, and come back and, um, and call for help. Um, again, calling for help is never a sign of weakness. Um, I've been doing this for 20 years. And um, if I see something not right, I always call for help. I even call for help from uh, surgeons who are junior than me and uh, ask them um, what they think and, and, if, and what to do. Um, if an experienced surgeon is available, they can attempt the repair. If not, it's important that uh, you place drains. Nothing is going to happen. The patient is still alive. Even if you clip the common bile duct, it, no, nothing's gonna happen to the patient in the next few days. So uh, do the right thing um, because if you try to, um, to ignore it or think that it actually did not happen and, or um, cover it up, it, it's not just gonna go away. Uh, the outcomes would be much, much worse. So if no experienced surgeon is available, just place drains, close uh, the abdomen, and send the patient to a tertiary center where um, the repair can be performed. So for patients who um, the injury is not recognized intraoperatively, uh, they usually present with, um, you do a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, patient goes home, and then they they call you or, or they come back with excessive pain. Um, you do blood work, you find they have abnormal LFTs, jaundice, sometimes bile coming from the port sites, uh, which is an ominous sign usually, um, or from a drainage tube. Sometimes they present with persistent nausea and sometimes vomiting and unusual abdominal distension or fever. So your uh, options at that point is um, to utilize some diagnostic tools, including ultrasonography and CT scan that can show you if there are intra-abdominal uh, collections, bilomas, bile duct dilatation, uh, and even vascular injury uh, sometimes can be seen on the CT scans. And then um, get a, some sort of a cholangiogram with uh, ERCP can be attempted first it would decide the anatomy and um, uh, assess the injury. If it's a tangential injury, as I will show you on some of the ERCPs, it can be treated with, um, with ERCP and stent placement. Uh, if the ERCP does not define the anatomy or because there's complete transection, then you may require a PTC to define the biliary anatomy and, and, and to identify where the proximal injury is. Some people use MRCP, which is non-invasive, but sometimes it can miss some minor leaks and it might not be available in all areas. MR angiography can be helpful in um, assessing uh, vascular injuries, but uh, again, it might not be available everywhere. So what to do, you, the approach to the uh, major bile duct injury? So what we do is um, if it is recognized early, early recognition or, or this total obstruction, 
If it's recognized within hours or days, we go for definitive surgical repair with some exceptions that I will mention. Uh, if it's recognized late, let's say more than a week, um, and there's sepsis, there are fevers and collections. So you try to treat uh, this um, with percutaneous biliary drainage and a uh, collection of any intra-abdominal drainage before, and you wait, you wait for weeks or month um, uh, until the inflammation subsides, and then you attempt the definitive surgical uh, repair. Um, just, um, I think there was a patient in, um, in Sudan that I operated on a few years ago um, who had a bile duct injury and then stayed for a month with fevers and bile coming from the incisions and, and nothing was done about it, which was uh, quite remarkable. Um, so for cystic duct leaks, which are probably the most common, the treatment of choice uh, is ERCP and sphincterotomy or endoscopic stenting um, and drainage of the uh, intra-abdominal collection. This ERCP shows a clear leak and uh, the second ERCP, which is this one, showed the retained stone. Sometimes the stones increase the pressure and um, the clip comes off the uh, cystic duct uh, resulting in, um, in bio leaks. Nearly all cystic duct leaks uh, will close this um, with this management, just with an ERCP, sphincterotomy, and a stent placement. But it's important to drain the bile duct collections intra-abdominally because the stent just decreases the pressure uh, in the biliary tree and does, not, does neither cover the leak uh, nor prevent the bile drainage. This is a patient actually I treated a few months ago who sustained a bile duct uh, injury and was, it wasn't even recognized intraoperatively, but um, the patient presented um, over a week later with fever and had this CT scan and was transferred to us. You can see he had um, on the CT scan two collections, one above the liver and one in the gallbladder fossa. So I had uh, the interventional radiologist place two drains, one in the subhepatic uh, collection and one um, in the subdiaphragmatic uh, collection, and uh, had an ERCP and, and um, uh, fixed the, um, had an ERCP and, and a stent. Uh, placed uh, and weeks later I saw him and there was complete resolution. You can see complete resolution of all the drains of the, all the collections and uh, he did fine. Uh, we talk a lot about the duct of Lushka, which is um, um, an accessory bile that, um, that can result in bile leaks in the post-operative period. So what is the duct of Lushka anyway? This paper uh, by Tom Schnaldorfer, who's a general surgeon in, um, and hepatobiliary surgeon also, but he's not in my uh, uh, group. He's in the general surgery group. Um, uh, published this paper in 2012 with a review um, uh, and classified the, um, the subvesical bile ducts into three types with type one, the duct um, drains uh, the right posterior insertion above the insertion of the cystic duct, or um, it can be uh, accessory subvesical um, bile duct. Type three classified as hepatic cholecystic bile duct, and this can be injured during cholecystectomy. And uh, type four is the aberrant um, subvesical uh, bile duct. So, for bile duct injury that is recognized in the um, uh, early postoperative period, that's less than seven days, uh, the recommendation is to control any bile collection use a HIDA scan, which is a nuclear study, a PTC or ERCP or both to define the site of the injury and um, 
decide whether it's a tangential injury versus complete transection. And because that would uh, dictate the, uh, the management of, um, of the bile duct injury. Uh, here is an ERCP that we did on a patient who sustained uh, an injury that shows a tangential um, injury uh, and a stricture that was uh, treated with uh, endoscopic stenting. Now, back to the classification of the bile duct injuries and what to do about them. Um, so classic, uh, though classic um, class one, uh, injury, if recognized intraoperatively, you can uh, try uh, to repair it immediately if they have, if somebody has the uh, experience or expertise. Uh, we use uh, absorbable sutures. Um, you can use any absorbable suture. We use uh, five or PDS, uh, simple interrupted uh, sutures. The insertion of a T-tube has been in the past uh, the gold standard, but now it became controversial as uh, it uh, sometimes might worsen that injury. So now that's for class one, a small injury. And actually uh, for class one, if you don't have the expertise, you can close the patient and do an ERCP and, uh, and uh, stent. And most of the times uh, it can uh, result in um, repair of that injury. So class two, now the injury happened at above the, um, the bifurcation or there is vascular injury um, or there's complete transection of the bile ducts. So what do you do if you recognize this intraoperatively? So there are two options. If a senior hepatobiliary surgeon is available, he or she should be called for immediate reconstruction. At least I got called twice over the past probably seven years to the operating room because one of the general surgeons has transected the common bile duct. And um, this is in a hospital where there is a hepatobiliary uh, surgeon available. And when that happens, the repair can be done and the reconstruction can be done. and in both cases, the patients actually ended up doing fine. So if not, um, there's no senior surgeon. Uh, again, all what you have to do is place trains and refer the patient, wake the patient, uh, tell the patient what happened, the family, and transfer the patient where uh, treatment can be, um, uh, repair can be done. Because if you try to, do it, it's, um, there are several reports that show that repair by the primary surgeon is uh, associated with less favorable outcomes. And sometimes the attempted repair can further damage the ducts and make subsequent reconstruction more difficult. So if you come up with anything from this, um, from this talk, um, come with the fact that don't try, if you don't have experience, don't try to repair the the bile duct injury. There's nothing wrong with asking for help. There's nothing wrong with closing the patient, admitting uh, there was an injury and transferring the patient. The patient will have a better outcome. A surgeon should take into consideration the extent of the injury as well as their own experience and skills in biliary surgery when determining the best approach uh, for the management of these injuries. This is, this is a video of a bile duct injury that um, I repaired um, in 2017, I think. Uh, the surgeon who was doing this um, procedure from Western Massachusetts, which is around 90 miles from our hospital, um, called me from the operating room and said, um, well, I was doing a lap coli and I injured the bile duct, uh, what should I do? And I told him, okay, that's fine. Just put um, uh, drains in and close the patient, wake the patient and transfer them. And he did transfer the patient to us. And he actually sent me a DVD with the whole operation. Uh, he 
tapes all his um, his procedures and he sent me the whole DVD. And um, I talked to him several times afterwards uh, to tell him that the patient was doing fine. But uh, he told me that I can use it for uh, educational purposes. And I'm going to show you what happened here and you might relate to it because this is, this is a classic injury. Uh, uh, oh, let me see if I can get it done. Okay, here we go. So um, here is a gallbladder clean, there's nothing. And then he grabs it. So what is, I'm going to stop it here. So what is wrong here? This is what started the whole thing. Number one, I mean, you know, in, in reality, um, I wasn't doing the operation, but, um, but looking at the video, I'll, I can show you what, uh, what the, the, the mistakes were. The duodenum is here. And here is where he should be grabbing the gallbladder, not here. Second, I want you to notice the pulsations of the hepatic artery. This is actually the common hepatic artery, uh, actually the proper hepatic artery, I take that back. The proper hepatic artery should not be that close to the cystic duct. Uh, you will see it pulsating the whole time while he's doing the dissection. But more importantly, you can see how close he was to the duodenum and the way he was holding the gallbladder. Although it looked okay. So here, here, here he proceeded um, to, uh, I, he sent me the whole thing like it was an hour. I edited it to, uh, for, um, to use it uh, for talks. So he started dissecting. Uh, like normal, like you would do for any lab coli. Looks good. It looks good. Um, but again, I want you to pay attention to the pulsations. He's like dissecting very close to the pulsations. That shouldn't be the case. There's something wrong when you see, you see the pulsations on the uh, hepatic artery right there. So now it looks like this is the cystic duct. And he uh, you see, he was trying to get to the uh, critical view of safety, but uh, uh, they steadered. It's not uh, the gallbladder. Oh, he, he tried on the other side as well, but the gallbladder is not really pulling out as uh, you would expect it to. Um, so now this looks like a cystic duct. I'm going to stop this here if I can. Uh, so here it looks like the cystic duct. And this looked like the artery, but uh, my observation is he's still holding it very close, number one. Number two, he did not clear this whole area before uh, clamping. Let's see what happened. So looks like any gallbladder, okay. Put two clips in, um, clip the other side. Then bring in the scissor, cut. Okay, yeah, it looks all right. Let's go. So he continues. Then he realizes there's something. There's another duct there. So he, dis he continues the dissection pulling the gold letter, cephalad, and then he realized, oh, there's another duck. Oh, I don't know, maybe it's some other duck. So he clips that duck. Two clips down one clip up and then he cuts it. But he's, a, from what I've seen, he's a pretty talented uh, laparoscopic surgeon. Um, he sees two ducks, so there's something wrong. So at this point he realized that there's something bad has happened. So he didn't just panic, but he, kind of went back and, and did some dissection 
to delineate the anatomy better. So he holds the duct and um, he does more dissection. And then he realizes that, oh, there is actually, this is actually what happened. So now he sees the cystic duct going into the common bile duct and that he actually, yes, so he actually re recognized that. And this is when I operated on the patient the next day, there are clips in the common bile duct that we removed and we cleaned the bile duct and we repaired that with Ruan Y hepatic ujejunostomy with the stent pull out, which I'm gonna show you uh, some video about that later. So for bile duct injuries that are recognized late in the postoperative period, um, that's greater than seven days, it's important to define the anatomy again with either a PTC, ERCP, um, strictures leak, control the bile leaks and the percutaneous drains, obtain a CT scan or an MRI to uh, assess uh, vascular injury. And we always recommend delayed repair after all the sepsis and the um, jaundice and has resolved. Partial hepatectomy is uh, rarely required, but in some cases, as I will show you, uh, failure of reconstructive approach or significant vascular injury, it remains a necessary option. This is a 66 year old woman who had uh, three days um, after uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, went home, three days presented with fever, abnormal LFTs, vomiting, and this is the CT scan that was obtained. Uh, as you can see, there's infarction in the right lobe of the liver, as well as uh, sub-diaphragmatic uh, collection, bile duct collection. You can see clear demarcation and infarction in the right lobe. So what did we do with this patient? Um, so we drained, uh, we placed percutaneous drains on the right as well as the left um, bile ducts. We drained all the abscesses, all the, uh, all the um, collections, treated her with antibiotics. LFTs went down to normal because there was, uh, uh, there was drainage of the bile ducts. You can see that there's a lot of clips here um, at the site of the injury. So this was actually six months after um, that injury. She was already drained. Uh, you can see we drained both right and left um, bile ducts. And what the resultant was dramatic atrophy of the right lobe. There was very little right lobe left. So we treated this patient with um, right um, hepatectomy and Ruan Y. I'm just gonna show you how we do the Ruan Y. I know some of you might have seen me do this um, at some point, but um, we use a biliary stent. Um, some people don't, but um, I routinely use a pediatric feeding tube. And that is the left bile duct. Uh, we place, uh, again, we use absorbable sutures. We use 5,4-PDS, but you can use whatever absorbable sutures are um, monofilament that's uh, available. We do the posterior layer first. Take a, this is the jejunal limb. Um, we take a bite on the jejunum and then on the posterior wall of the um, bile duct. Then we tie the um, sutures to the posterior wall. That's the posterior layer. <clears throat> and then I usually put a suture through the tube. I cut the tube. I put a suture through the tube and that basically to prevent it from falling into the jejunum. Um, 
the stitch and it's absorbable suture so it will dissolve in six weeks and I'll, when I remove the and then I take a bite on the anterior wall of the bile duct and then pass the uh, stent into the um, bile duct After that, um, we tie that and we just complete the um, anterior layer. That's how we do the uh, bile duct uh, Roux and Y, a hepatic ostomy. So this is the, we always like to um, document the anatomy in the post-operative period. So you can see this is the post-operative cholangiogram with the, the left uh, segment four, segment two and three. This is the left duct um, draining into the jejunal limb. This is an 18 year old woman who was undergoing elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy for the first episode of biliary colic. Um, and uh, a week after she had this CRCP that did not show the um, intrahepatic bile ducts, she had a PTC that showed that the injury is very, very high. Um, we drained her and waited two months and she ended up having a right hepatic artery injury and she underwent a right hepatectomy and drew and Y hepatic ostomy to the left lobe. Uh, remember, this was an 18 year old who was undergoing lap coli probably for something that she didn't need. Um, I will talk a little bit about the uh, excluded uh, bile duct. Um, this is an intraoperative cholangiogram during laparoscopic cholecystectomy because they found an extra duct. I know I talked about it during, you know, in the beginning uh, when we're reviewing the abnormal anatomy, but uh, they noticed that there's an extra duct entering the uh, cystic duct. Um, it was interpreted as normal and was ligated. Three years later, actually, I didn't see her back then, but um, I saw her three years later when um, she she continued to have abdominal pain and biliary colic and, and, and the surgeon did an MRCP um, and found this. So what you see here is the excluded bile, right bile duct that was clipped during cholecystectomy and resulted in all these uh, of her symptoms. Because there was uh, no liver atrophy, we just ended up uh, implanting that right hepatic duct into the roux, and that resolved all her symptoms. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the associated vascular injuries, uh, most commonly the right hepatic duct, although I have seen the right uh, a portal vein uh, injured during uh, cholec uh, cholecystectomy. This is just uh, an, an, an picture of the anatomy of the um, bile of the arterial system uh, in the hilum of the liver. And there's so many variations. Um, the, the typical anatomy is uh, it runs posterior to the uh, common bile duct, but there's sometimes a replace right that comes off the SMA. There's uh, uh, replace left. Um, but I think the most dangerous one is the right hepatic artery, which is running anterior to, and we see this in around 10% of the um, of uh, normal healthy individuals. Why is that? Because it is mistaken as the cystic artery. This is how it's injured um, when um, the bile duct is, is mistaken as this, the, when the common bile duct is mistaken as the cystic duct and is clipped, then you're trying to take the gallbladder out. Um, you take the, the, the proximal bile duct, uh, you, in, you end up injuring the, uh, the right hepatic artery. This is a CT scan um, of a patient that had um, 
injury to the right hepatic artery and, and portal vein. So this is uh, performed within hours and it clearly shows that there is uh, infarction in the right lobe. Again, this is another CT scan of a different patient um, that showed right hepatic artery injury. You can see the um, demarcation of uh, the right lobe. Now, importantly, an arteriogram that was done two years later in the same patient has shown that there are a lot of collaterals that developed from the left lobe um, and atrophy in the right lobe. So that indicates that sometimes it's better if the patient is drained to wait um, until the collaterals develop. This is a, a angiogram of a patient who had a cholecystectomy and kept presenting with pain and ended up uh, having a, a CT scan that showed the pseudoaneurysm. This is the angiogram that was done by the radiologist. They ended up treating this with uh, thrombin, uh, closing the pseudoaneurysm. Bile duct injuries with uh, vascular injuries have high rate of bile duct strictures, obviously, because of the ischemia. If there's a known right hepatic artery injury, um, we try to delay the repair for several weeks to allow for arterial uh, collateralization to form. So finally, I will go over some of the, um, of the task force uh, questions and answers. This is, and again, this is available online. I just uh, put this in, uh, in the talk. This is the multi-society practice guideline, the state-of-the-art consensus conference on the prevention of bile duct injuries during cholecystectomy. So they had multiple questions. So here is uh, from the paper. Uh, question one, should the critical view of safety uh, versus other technique, example, the infundibular top-down or intraoperative cholangiogram, cholangiography be used um, to mitigate the risk of bile duct injury during laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So basically the question, just the, use the critical view of safety or use intraoperative cholangiogram to mitigate uh, bile duct injury during laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So the recommendation is, uh, this is from the consensus conference, uh, in patients undergoing laparoscopic cholecystectomy, we suggest that surgeons use the critical view of safety for anatomic identification of the cystic duct. So they do not recommend for just uh, regular cholecystectomy and intraoperative cholangiogram. The second question was, uh, should the fundus first top-down technique versus subtotal cholecystectomy be used to mitigate risk of bile duct injury when the critical view of safety cannot be achieved during laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So the question basically is, if you cannot get to the uh, critical view of safety because of inflammation, scarring, whatever, what should we do? Is top-down technique versus subtotal cholecystectomy. So the recommendation is, um, when the critical view of safety cannot be achieved, you cannot get because of whatever, uh, and the anatomy, biliary anatomy cannot be clearly defined. Like you, you, you don't know what, 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 what is what. By other methods, including the imaging during laparoscopic cholecystectomy, we suggest that surgeons consider subtotal cholecystectomy, basically taking the body and down to the neck of the gallbladder and then close. Um, over total cholecystectomy by the infundibular or um, they, they suggest that surgeons consider subtotal cholecystectomy over total cholecystectomy by fundus down, uh, fundus first top down approach. So the recommendation is if you cannot isolate the cystic duct and um, get the critical view of safety is to go top down um, fundus first approach and do subtotal cholecystectomy subtotal cholecystectomy rather than do a total cholecystectomy. So you basically take most of the gallbladder, but leave the neck. Another question is, should the 
Intraoperative uh, biliary imaging, intraoperative cholangiography uh, or ultrasound versus no intraoperative uh, imaging be used to mitigate the risk of uh, bile duct injury during laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So the recommendation is in patients with acute cholecystitis or chronic cholecystitis, they suggest the liberal use of um, cholangiography during uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy to mitigate the risk of bile duct injury. However, this was a conditional recommendation, very low certainty of evidence. So what they're saying is if there is um, a patient in patients with acute cholecystitis, uh, they or there's some inflammation, they suggest liberal use of uh, intraoperative uh, cholangiograms. In patients with uncertainty of biliary anatomy or suspicion of bile duct injury during laparoscopic cholecystectomy, we recommend that surgeons use intraoperative biliary imaging in particular intraoperative cholangiogram. So they recommended intraoperative cholangiogram if you are uncertain of the biliary anatomy or the suspicion that there might be bile duct injury, do the intraoperative cholangiogram. Another question, should immediate cholecystectomy defined as performed within 72 hours of symptoms, symptom onset uh, be used in acute cholecystitis versus delayed cholecystectomy? That's a common question. Delayed cholecystectomy is defined as between 72 hours and 10 days after the symptom onset, six to 12 weeks after symptom onset, or greater than 12 weeks after symptom onset. So basically, you know, a patient comes, he has cholecystitis, uh, maybe fever, uh, ultrasound shows um, acute cholecystitis, have high white count. What do you do? Do you take the gallbladder or wait? or if they present uh, between 72 hours and 10 days, or they present, they have the symptoms for weeks or month. Should you just proceed with cholecystectomy? So the recommendation here is in patients presenting with mild acute cholecystitis, we suggest that surgeon perform laparoscopic cholecystectomy within 72 hours of symptom onset. So if, if it is mild cholecystitis, within three days, proceed with cholecystectomy. Uh, it's a low certainty of evidence, but this is the recommendation. Patients with moderate to severe cholecystitis, there's insufficient evidence to make the recommendation, particularly as it relates to bile duct injury. There is not enough evidence. But um, in uh, patients who present with acute cholecystitis, there is no um, recommend, uh, there's no, the recommendation is to proceed within uh, if they present it within um, three days. Another question, should subtotal cholecystectomy versus total laparoscopic or open cholecystectomy be used uh, for mitigating the risk of bile duct injury in marked acute inflammation or chronic biliary inflammatory fusion, BIF? So you open, so the question here is, you open or you know you put the laparoscope and you started the cholecystectomy and now it's this chronic inflammation, this fusion, you can get the planes, everything is bleeding, what do you do? So the recommendation is when marked acute local inflammation or chronic cholecystitis with biliary uh, inflammatory fusion of tissues, tissue contraction is encountered during laparoscopic cholecystectomy that prevent the safe identification of the cystic duct and artery, we suggest that surgeons perform subtotal cholecystectomy, either laparoscopically or open, depending on their skill set and comfort with the procedure. So you, again, you, you went in with the laparoscope, you started the cholecystectomy, you realized that there's a lot of inflammation, you can move the gallbladder, you can identify the cystic duct safely. The recommendation is to perform subtotal cholecystectomy, which is safe, safer. Um, finally, I um, want to um, talk a little bit about the Anthony Eden's um, biliary tract saga, um, something I, um, I thought is very interesting. Um, this paper also available uh, online, and I strongly urge you to read it if you are interested in uh, history of medicine and history of the world for that matter. It was written by um, John Brash um, and published at the Annals of Surgery in 2003. 
Joan Brash was actually the third uh, chairman of surgery at the Leahy Clinic. The Leahy Clinic was, uh, which I work in, um, was established uh, in Boston by Frank Leahy um, in the 1930s. And uh, the first chairman of surgery was Frank Leahy. The second chairman of surgery was uh, Richard Cattell, which I'm going to talk about. Um, and the third chairman of surgery was Joan Brash, who was the chairman of surgery, I think, in the 60s, probably sometime. I met him several times, and he died in 2017, John Brash. He actually operated on Anthony Eden. He did the last operation. So I don't know if you guys know Anthony Eden. Some of you might know who he was. But um, uh, Anthony Eden um, was the youngest foreign secretary in Great Britain's history. Uh, he subsequently became the prime minister of England, uh, of Great Britain, succeeding Winston Churchill. Um, he had a bile duct injury during cholecystectomy. Uh, Anthony Eden uh, was uh, the youngest secretary. He was a foreign secretary of um, uh, foreign secretary. That's like foreign minister of Great Britain in the 1950s when Winston Churchill was the prime minister. In nine in April 1953, uh, Robert. Uh, Anthony Eden had uh, a scheduled cholecystectomy because he had previous symptoms of um, jaundice, abdominal pain, and presence of stones. He was a rising political star, and uh, everybody knew that he was going to be the prime minister after Winston Churchill. So in, in April 1953, he had um, a cholecystectomy done. And, ooh, which, uh, according to the um, uh, to the reports, um, there was nothing abnormal um, about that surgery, uh, and they did not report any anything that happened. However, postoperatively, he uh, developed uh, external biliary fistula. He was developing bile coming out of the wound, and he became jaundice and febrile. Now. Um, they took him back to the OR on April 29th, um, and they found a large subhepatic uh, bile uh, biloma, and um, they placed a T-tube. They said they were able to probe the distal duct, but not the proximal duct. They placed a T-tube, but he had he continued to have uh, fevers, but his jaundice resolved. Um, they put another tube that drained bile. It wasn't very clear, but in the paper, they show you some of the uh, images that was done. Uh, Dr. Brash went to, uh, he got a lot of the information from medical records in, uh, in England. So, um, Anthony Eden, uh, having had that uh, misfortune, it happened that Richard Cattell, who I told you was the second chairman of surgery, and he was he was in London for the in 1950 in May of 1953 for um, the for a talk at the Royal College of Surgeons, and he was known worldwide as an um, outstanding, technically gifted uh, surgeon, especially with bile duct. Um, uh, so. His surgeon asked Dr. Cattell to see him. So Dr. Cattell saw uh, Anthony Eden and um, reviewed his records and recommended that he needs another operation, um, uh, which is a ruin why hepatic ostomy. Obviously, Winston Churchill was um, not uh, happy that uh, his foreign secretary would go to the United States to get his operation and pressured uh, Richard Cattell to have the surgery done in London. But uh, Cattell insisted that he wanted to do the operation in Boston in, with his own surroundings and that it's a big operation. Uh, the, at the end, he ended up uh, doing the operation in Boston in June of, 2000, uh, in June of 1953. Uh, where uh, it was described that the he had 
uh, injury to the proximal duct then a Ruan Y was done. Uh, so in 1955, um, Anthony Eden became the Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain. And um, in 1955, he started having um, some fevers. I think it, he had cholangitis. Um, now, uh, uh, history would would tell you, and I don't know if you if you're uh, familiar with the history of the Middle East, uh, but um, in 1956, Jamal Abdel Nasser um, uh, nationalized the Suez Canal. He did that because um, he wanted uh, to build the Aswan Dam, as said the Ali, and. Um, and he wanted funded from Great Britain and uh, the United States who promised him. But then he had this um, Arab nationalism agenda and, and he was supporting the um, Algerian independence and anti-Israel. And so they ended up withdrawing their support for, um, for um, uh, funding the Aswan Dam. So he's, on, I think it was uh, July of 1956, he, he gave a speech in Alexandria and um, Jamal Abdel Nasser declared that uh, the Suez Canal is uh, uh, nationalized and it's Egyptian. At the time it was controlled and owned by Great Britain. So this was a crisis that um, fell in um, for Anthony Eden to deal with. So um, what does he do? So Anthony Eden, Great Britain uh, conspired with, um, with uh, Israel and France to invade and take over the uh, Suez Canal. Actually, this is not something, I, this is like uh, documented in all the books, in the, all the history books. Um, and uh, actually, if you watch any of the movies about the Suez Canal uh, crisis, you will see that Anthony Eden at the time, he was taking medications, he was sick, he was having fever sometimes. I think it was all because of cholangitis from uh, uh, biliary strictures. But um, what ended up happening is um, this was all, all uh, staged. So Israel went into the Sinai Peninsula and um, and this was all agreed up, agreed upon by the French and the uh, British uh, under uh, Eden, that they are going to have Israel going to the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, the Egyptian military will engage with Israel. They're gonna ask for them to stop the fighting and they will not stop. So the British and French troop will go in and then they will seize the canal. And in their um, plan was actually to throw Jamal Abdel Nasser off power uh, because he was causing so many problems for Israel, for um, Britain, for France. So this was conspired. They didn't tell the United Nations. They didn't tell the United States. Uh, and Eisenhower was the president at the time. So this started and then, um, and they invaded um, and took uh, the Suez Canal, but uh, that created a huge international backlash. And um, uh, Eisenhower um, said that he disagreed with them and he ordered, and together with the United Nation, he told Israel to withdraw from the Sinai Peninsula and told the British and the French to get out of Egypt. Um, with that international pressure, because he also uh, threatened some um, uh, financial hardship for uh, Great Britain, um, they called the ceasefire and Anthony Eden ended up uh, withdrawing all the British and French troops from Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, Israel withdrew from the Sinai Peninsula, the British uh, withdrew their troops from, um, from uh, the Suez Canal. This was a very monumentous um, moment in history because number one, it was a great humiliation for Great Britain um, that incident, but also um, 
it marked the beginning, uh, the end of Great Britain being having the influence over the Middle East and the start of the United States being uh, uh, the uh, one who actually have influence. The reason I brought this story up is uh, in this talk, other than me being tangentially uh, uh, related to it um, through John Brash, but um, is to show you that bile duct injury um, not only can have impact on um, the patient and the surgeon, but can also have international, national and international implications. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'll be happy to take any of the, the calls. By the way, this is uh, where I work, Roger Jenkins Transplant Institute, and this is the Leahy Hospital and Medical Center. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Harkot. That was absolutely great talk and a very important topic. Um, very um, underestimated um, risk when we take um, this procedure that a lot of us here are taking it for granted, but it still have a huge implication, huge risk after. Um, um, we're gonna now open the opportunity for comments and questions. We have actually great attendance with us. Uh, in addition to the registrars, we have a bunch of uh, our seniors, um, professors and, and surgeons back home in Sudan, and also some of the expert GI surgeons. Um, we have some questions posted in the written Q&A functionality. I will come to it, but I would like first to uh, open opportunities for comments and questions from the audience. Remember to do that. You will have to uh, use the raise hand functionality. Uh, click on the participant button at the bottom of the screen that will open a list on the right. And then at the bottom, you will see raise hand and that will allow me to see you and open an opportunity for you. Otherwise you won't be able to unmute yourself or talk. So we're using either that or the written uh, Q&A functionality. We can go ahead and take questions now. Okay, so we have uh, Dr. Osman Saleh, he's with us here in the United States. Uh, Dr. Osman, uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, you can go ahead and talk. Hello, uh, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you to Dr. Muhammad Akut, my boss. Uh, it is not actually a question, it is a comment. And I know you highlighted uh, about the interoperative clangiogram as one means of to try to minimize or to try to delineate the biliary anatomy during a procedure. I know there's a lot of controversy. Some people still do it routinely. Others, they found it is not you know, as necessary. And it has a learning curve, of course. But what I want to say in my practice, and uh, there's something come up, and that actually is kind of mirrored the, the use of robotic surgery, which is a, a use of endocyanin green an ICG, which is I found, uh, hello, can you hear me guys? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you very well, go ahead. Yeah, ICG, it, it, it's a, a dye that you give like 30 to 40 minutes prior to taking the patient to the OR. And, and it helps a lot of time, you know, to delineate anatomy. I use it routinely and I found it very helpful. It to give you some reassurance sometimes in very, you know, and it is not as kind of high maintenance as, you know, the intraoperative cholangiogram. Something here to highlight and to stress is cholangiogram or anything you do intraoperatively, open or close, is not a substitute to being very careful. As Dr. Akkot say, be very, very, have a very low threshold to call for help if you are not clear. Try not to be heroic. Try not to do anything that is not clear to you. If you don't know the anatomy, it is not, it does not take anything from you if you call for help or if you call it for the day off or if you just put drains or open, you know, yes, this procedure, as you said, a lot of time we do it in young people. They come with just one episode of biliary colic. They do not need to, to go into hell by just, you know, someone who's trying to be, you know, like, oh, I'm a good surgeon, I'm a good laparoscopic surgeon. And thank you. Uh, may I uh, just uh, respond? Thank you, Usman. That was uh, that was a very uh, good um, comment. The endocyanin in green. Actually, you're right. This is I, I didn't know that you you use it for uh, cholecystectomies. I use it actually for um, 
for robotic living donor hepatectomies. And it's pretty impressive um, the way it shows the ducts. So uh, I, I think that that's, um, and, and it's like you said, you don't have to insert anything, the anesthesiologist just give it. Um, uh, and again, you're right. Uh, most a lot of times we do this in young people. I'm on the other receiving end. I don't usually do laparoscopic cholecystectomies. I all I end up um, getting the injuries, so I always see the bad end of it, where um, there's an 18 year old who had one episode of lap coli and ends up with a right hepatectomy or something like that. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Arkod and uh, Dr. Osman. This is actually a topic dear to my heart. I'm a big fan of uh, um, fluorescent laparoscopy and using ICG for those who are um, new to this technology. Uh, it's actually a use of a special light camera. Um, it's actually a special wavelength even below the infrared uh, where you actually inject the patient uh, IV with uh, a, a fluorescent material. It's called endocyanin green. And that actually goes into the bloodstream and it gets concentrated in the liver and it's secreted or secreted in the biliary tree. So by using that and using that special um, scoping and uh, uh, to visualize that uh, live wave, you can actually visualize the biliary tree looking either green or blue, whatever the color uh, the, the company of that scope is using uh, to show the biliary tree. Um, that's an interesting topic. I'm going to move on now to uh, um, the next um, opportunity. We have. Uh, Dr. Walid Al Hajj, uh, I'm going to give you here the opportunity to talk. Please uh, go ahead. Just remember to unmute yourself first. Dr. Walid, you just need to unmute yourself. We can't hear you, but you have an opportunity to talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Akram and Muhammad, for this very comprehensive presentation. Just I want to add a few practical points. Uh, you face uh, this problem with us, Dr. Akwad, uh, considering the setup in Sudan. Uh, actually, uh, when to respond to pillar injuries in here in Sudan, usually we lose, we, we, we usually our patients who are referred to us, they die within, with after, immediately after injury. I mean that they develop peritonitis and they have delayed presentation or delayed referral, and there is no immediate response to have this peritoneal drainage, either uh, ultrasound guided or whether laparoscopic, uh, uh, ultrasound guided, radiologically guided, or uh, by doing conventional labrotomies to drain this peritonitis. And uh, we have a golden time for draining this peritonitis because the setup especially in the uh, province of Sudan is not, uh, cannot meet patients with uh, delayed peritonitis and intra-abdominal sepsis. So better to, to drain patients very early and better to refer them earlier to two specialized center here in Ibn Sina or in uh, Sobo Hospital. The telephones of uh, hepatobiliary resurgence are available and you can just call them. Uh, fortunately, the number of cases who die because of peritonitis, they are coming uh, fewer in the last uh, two years because of the availability of uh, service. So the response to biliary injury should be prompt, immediate, and in collaboration with these centers. My question to Dr. Akot, who should refer patients to the ER CDC? Uh, I think uh, this is a very important question. We have to uh, raise it to and to direct it to. Sorry, the, Walid. The, who, who who refers what? Uh, I mean that uh, most of the injuries or yeah. uh, patient who had injuries here in Sudan, they send them directly to the ERC without uh, considering the presence of uh, peritoneal collections of pile uh, patients, uh, clinical status, they're having peritonitis, intra-abdominal sepsis, and they are very ill. And uh, this is a very important question. Uh, you, I need to hear from you. When to refer patient to ERCV and who should refer them to the ERCV? Uh, thank you, Dr. 
So, so the, the question is uh, the, the ERCP. Um, so uh, again, uh, we, we are treating a patient. We're not, uh, we're not treating just the, the injury. So if the patient is stable, not having fevers, but I can see that in the first postoperative um, in the first postoperative day, there's bile coming out of the uh, drain. I think it's reasonable to do an ERCP at that point. The patient is not septic and um, do the ERCP first and then drain the bile. Uh, the ERCP will delineate if there's any injury, um, do the uh, sphincterotomy, uh, drain the bile duct, and then do a CT scan. And if there is, um, uh, if there is a collection, I think placing a percutaneous drainage is not uh, ultrasound guided or CT guided. I don't think that that's a very difficult procedure. That's all what you need to do at that point. Um, not when the patient is uh, septic and has uh, fever. So the other thing is, so now a patient comes in uh, septic, have fever, have high white count, so and jaundice. So what do you do? Um, so. Uh, again, you have to do this all, all this again, a CT scan, drain the abscess, antibiotics, ERCP. Um, whoever is treating the patient should refer for the ERCP. And, um, and the ERCP is important. Um, if, if the injury is just a cystic duct leak, or if it is um, something that can be treated endoscopically, it can be the, the it can make the difference, uh, the ERCP. Uh, if, if the ERCP cannot show anything, then probably you have a higher um, uh, injury and um, a PTC is required. I don't know how, how widely available the PTCs are uh, in, uh, in Sudan. Mm. Does that answer the question, Dr. Walid? Uh, Dr. Walid Al-Hajj is one of the HPV surgeons in Sudan, so um, yeah. he might also help with the uh, uh, question about the availability of PTC. Just I want to stress on the uh, timing of uh, operating on patients and draining them very uh, before they sending them to us. And that's what Dr. Akkod elaborated in his uh, criteria of patient selection for ERCD. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna uh, move on. Um, we have uh, three more also raised hand. Uh, I know there are some written questions, some of them from Dr. Bushar was also asking for opportunity. I'll start first with Dr. Omar al Farouk. Uh, Dr. Omar, um, let me just get here to, yeah, you can go ahead, please. And uh, just remember to unmute yourself before talking. Oh. Hold on, Dr. Omar, I think we lost you here. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Omar. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, hello. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Akram, uh, Muhammad Akkod, thank you very much for this uh, very important topic. And I think our junior doctor benefited a lot today from this very nice talk, uh, simple. Uh, I think you, you highlight the main message we should convey to our junior doctors and our uh, seniors. Uh, and I, I, I totally agree with you that the message is that if you have a difficult gallbladder, you should either do a subtotal colectomy or, or in rare cases, there is no shame of bailing out. Yeah, and it the procedure altogether. In my lifetime, I bail out in two cholecystectomies, very uh, inflamed, adhesion, contracted gallbladder. There is no shame. Uh, and this is especially for the, our junior doctors and uh, consultant. If you find that the gallbladder is very difficult and you don't have the expertise and you don't have the facilities, there is no shame that either you do a subtotal colectum or you bail out. Uh, close the patient, uh, wait for a proper opportunity with the, uh, with the senior consultants and good facilities and do the patient again. Uh, again, thank you very much, Mr. Mohammed, for this very nice talk. Uh, I agree with Walid. We face in Sudan here is uh, our problem that we don't have, uh, or rarely, 
the facility is very scarce to have percutaneous drainage, ultrasound guide or CT guided. Uh, and sometimes you face with a very septic patient. Uh, I think uh, what Walid is saying that when you are faced with a very ill patient, uh, you can, if you don't have the facilities for CT or ultrasound guided drainage, you can go and do a labrotomy, uh, wash the patient, put good drains, and then in a good time, send him for an ERCP or MRCP, uh, an ERCP and drainage. Uh, <clears throat> I, think, I think Mohammed faced with us a couple of cases that uh, due to lack of facilities, we, we could not do more than that. And if, as Mohammed say, if you have a patient who is clinically uh, stable, then you can go first for the ERCP and stenting. And then if there is a uh, collection, either you do CT or ultrasound guided, or in our case in Sudan, because sometimes it's very difficult to do that, you can go and do an open drainage of the abscess. Uh, thank you very much, Mohammed, for this very nice presentation. We benefit a lot. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Umar and Walid. Uh, I, I, I didn't realize <coughs> that um, percutaneous drainage uh, might be an issue. So I agree with you. Uh, if if there is any any question about uh, uh, the availability of the percutaneous, because that's uh, quite frankly what I have, what I noticed is the mainstay of the treatment of these patients. The minute you drain their abscess, they and you give them antibiotics, they get better and they become afebrile, the white count, and they and you have all the time in the world to fix their bile duct. Um, I think you're right. Uh, you can do it laparoscopically. You can stick a laparoscope in, wash the abdomen, or even laparotomy for that matter. Um, the patients are gonna do fine, but not... Um, I remember in one of the cases that I uh, had in uh, Sudan, uh, I think uh, I, one of the surgeons, um, uh, was talking about how the patient had the injury and then for a month uh, kept having fevers and nothing was done and kept saying, well, the body is not just going to form a ruin why by themselves, So, which is true. So the most important thing is to drain the abscess and treat the sepsis uh, because that's what's going to kill the patient uh, and drain the bile duct, uh, drain the bile duct uh, somehow. Uh, because bile under pressure is uh, causes cholangitis and, and sepsis and all this. So you drain the bile duct. I've shown you uh, during this talk that drain the bile duct, drain the uh, collection. You have all the time in the world to uh, fix uh, the injury, uh, repair the injury at the appropriate time. So I agree with uh, Omar and, uh, and Walid regarding that uh, comment. Wait. Uh, I'm going to move on then to um, our next opportunity uh, with Dr. Bushra Ibn Auf. Um, let me just open the opportunity here. Dr. Bushra, just feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead, please. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Well, I would like to publicly يعني, thank uh, Mr. Muhammad Akud, not for the lecture, but uh, 1996, 24 years ago, when I was a fifth year medical student coming from Sudan to do my USMLE examination, step one, he came and picked me up from the gray stage, uh, it's much yeah. kind of Greyhound, Greyhound. Greyhound stage Greyhound in New stage. Jersey. <laughs> in New Jersey. Bakhri Jalil, Rabbana Yathrab Al Khair. I, I, I remember that. <laughs> Uh, it was a fun weekend you spent with us. <laughs> yes. Yes. That was, that was nice. <laughs> and I have actually a, a question and a comment. The question is about uh, the ERCP uh, management for uh, the bile duct leaks. Uh, we all know in those for simple leaks, uh, cystic duct leaks, it is uh, sufficient to do an ERCP with sphincterotomy alone or sphincterotomy uh, with a stent. And the proximal end of the stent doesn't even need to be high up to the point of the cystic duct insertion into the common bile duct. That is enough to heal the cyst most cystic duct leaks. 
My question is about the tangential uh, CBD leaks uh, that are not uh, corrected surgically. Uh, if I do place a stent, is there a benefit? Hal uh, al stent ikun deep enough so that its proximal end is actually above the site of the injury? Uh, does that technique uh, allows better healing and probably lead to less late strictures? Or uh, can I use the same technique with the cystic duct leaks? So uh, before you before you move, let me answer this. Uh, yeah, I remember uh, Bushra, it's good to, ha to have you here. It was a fun weekend you spent with us. Uh, first, uh, you had uh, a different way of uh, 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 of uh, talking that we were used to, you were all, you were younger than us, so we found it intriguing. I'm still younger than you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, regarding that's a very good question. I, um, I I agree with you. The the for cystic duct leaks, uh, you really don't you don't really even have to put a stent. But uh, with the sphincterotomy, reducing the pressure, most of the cystic duct leaks will heal. Um, and now placing the stent, um, you, you don't have to go above the cystic duct. You're right to heal that um, injury. But um, for tangential uh, CBD not repaired surgically, um, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. My uh, sense is I saw the uh, gastroenterologists here um, one time place a metal stent, a removable metal stent that um, closed the um, the injury site and then removed it uh, later. But um, uh, but I, I don't know the answer to that question, if it can be just repaired um, by, um, by doing the sphincterotomy and, and treating it the same way if it's just a tangential. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that yeah, question. The, the, reason, the reason I brought that up, yeah, Mr. Akkod, in, sometimes you think in when you put a stent against the leak, yeah, uh, you can prevent uh, later strictures, yeah. and yeah, you might true. help the CBD to re-epithelialize over the stent. True. Uh, but at the same time, the friction of the stent might cause. So, so I don't know, and I tried to look up the answer, but I guess it, it just depends on on experience. Yeah, I'm uh, not I'm not sure what the um, what the answer, answer would be, but I sure. think I think my my in my experiences um, they may end up developing a stricture regardless of what you do, okay. Okay. and um, that can be either treated endoscopically with dilatation, multiple dilatation, and you know in the United States people like to put stents so that they go back and take it out. That's another <laughs> procedure <laughs> that they can bill for. So, the, the, other, the other issue really is about the question. You, you, you um, uh, showed an example of the 18 years old young female who had a very يعني, sad uh, story later on. Unfortunately, this story is quite common in Sudan. Hassi, يعني, I, I, can, I, I just want to say one thing. The number of bile duct injuries that we see in Khartoum uh, is a lot. And maybe the surgeons who practice in Sudan, they see that. Uh, lab colis, uh, cholecystectomies in general are done all over Sudan, and many hospitals have laparoscopic equipment. So surgeons who are not well-trained or experienced, they embark on these lab colis. So we're seeing lots of injuries. Unlike the US, there is no backup يعني, uh, for ERCP, is only available in Khartoum and the Madani, and it's only about a handful of endoscopists uh, who do ERCP serving a population of 40 million. PTC, uh, interventional radiology, is even less experienced uh, surgeons uh, who can do timely repair uh, are also limited. For most patients, they come in very late. For the question, 
uh, should we go backwards and have surgeons in the periphery uh, do just open cholecystectomies? I know this is a, a, a very bold uh, suggestions, uh, lacking um, if it is safer, even if it means longer recovery, uh, maybe that's the way to go. Uh, and that's and that, that that's my fifty cents يعني, on the issue. So Bushra, I I I agree with you. I actually didn't uh, reckon, uh, realize that that that's a a, a big problem, and uh, but I I agree with you. There should be some sort of uh, consortium about the safety of cholecystectomy, as you have seen, and and I'm sure you have, and other surgeons have seen that the consequences of uh, a young patient who has some biliary colic and they undergo a, a simple cholecystectomy ends up being a disaster. Um, I think there should be a, a, some sort of consortium and, and, and recommendation. Um, if uh, open cholecystectomy is safer in al Gabarif, I think it, it it should be done um, because up till today, even in the United States, the um, the incidence of bile duct injury is higher in laparoscopic cholecystectomy than open cholecystectomy. That's for sure. That's known. Um, that has not changed uh, even with uh, training. I think I think education, training, and awareness and um, and recommendations. Um, they have to um, they have to emphasize these um, these measures if, if you're not uh, comfortable doing these procedures or if you don't have backup you shouldn't be doing them uh, like like the, the the case that I showed um, that, that that surgeon I think is a pretty talented laparoscopic surgeon he recognized that there is a problem he called me from the upgrading room he didn't wait like you know, um, but, you know, again, here it's different, you know, he knows that he can call here and, you know, we can bring the patient and take care of him. But, um, but that should be the attitude of all surgeons. Um, they should call the Messina, they should call, you know, uh, Soba, whatever they have uh, the capabilities of um, repairing these injuries. Um, as soon as they have the injury and not try to, I get throughout the talk, I was trying to tell people that um, don't try to pretend like it didn't happen or um, try to hide it. It's, it's not going to be, it's not going to help. Uh, the patient can be managed if referred early and if managed appropriately. But if the if you don't recognize it or or you recognize it but you think that you know the patient is just just miraculously uh, get better uh, the patients actually are not going to get better thank you very much um, mr akod um, dr bushra uh, this is definitely going to open a very interesting discussion uh, i see hands raising and i want to also hear from all our specialists and the registrars too would like to hear your questions and comments on this I'm gonna go next to um, Dr. Nadir Hilal. Um, he was raising his hand earlier. Then I think they have we have other people who wanted to comment on the topic about the open quality. Um, so let me just give the chance here. Go ahead, Dr. Nadir. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Or comment. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we do. Good. So good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for a very comprehensive lecture and a very good. Um, discussion about it. So just a few comments. Um, maybe you don't know that um, here, I think in Sudan, the standard of care here for cholecystectomy is open cholecystectomy. Most of the uh, hospitals, especially in the um, outside Khartoum, they are using, we are doing open cholecystectomies. Most of these operations are done by registrar. Dr. Sometimes Nader. not even see. Am I back? No. Yeah, you're back now. Yes. Sorry. So, okay. So uh, it's done by by registrars, by senior registrars. Um, I will attribute the uh, the high incidence of bile in bile bile duct injuries to the learning curve. So re I think recently now you have some um, 
um, uh, laparoscopic, uh, laparoscopic uh, uh, towers. People are trying to learn laparoscopy. The easiest way is to train in patients. We don't have like um, a well-constructed simulation. Uh, simulation, not even like uh, teaching or education, it's just courses here and there, a week or two, and then everybody will come and try to do this. Uh, although it's like there is some surgeons that are trying to uh, to establish this this uh, this operations laparoscopically, but honestly, most of the time it is done by young surgeons, young registrars, open cholestectomies most of the time, and most of the time, the injuries are coming from open cholestectomies, not laparoscopic cholestectomies, if I am if not mistaken. Uh, and then there is things this this like. Especially as registrars, they are like, uh, it's, it's like if you do a small incision, then it will be better. Uh, actually, it's better, but it comes with the skills. So they are trying to, to minimize this incision, many cholestectomy, four centimeters without good view. So here we can't use the, 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 the view of safety. You can't see the infantibulum. You can't see anything, especially with with, uh, with inflamed gallbladder and things. Um, so I think what is your advice for the young surgeons, the young registrars, especially who are doing open cholestectomies? How safe can they go is this thing? Um, and, and another comment is that for a long time, if you do a, a, a bile duct injury, it's considered as taboo. And then like people will start talking about you, you did that and you did this, and this leads to that. If you are, if you suspect a bile duct injury, you will just go over it, you know. So, like, I don't know what, how to say it, but that was the situation now. So, yeah. what's your advice for the young surgeons who are doing open cholestectomies? We don't have the uh, telesis to do ICG, even I think it needs a very advanced uh, laparoscopic towers. Uh, we don't have even the, the basics laparoscopic towers here. So, what's your advice? Thank you very much. So, so thank you, Nadir, for uh, all uh, uh, th these comments. Uh, regarding the open cholecystectomy, I think um, that um, training in open cholecystectomy, open cholecystectomy seems to be safer uh, with less bile duct injury than the um, than the laparoscopic um, counterpart. So uh, I think it all relates to the training and um, the accountability um, and in doing the, the cholecystectomy. I, I, I know you mentioned that the registrars, I guess this is a whole system problem, not, um, not uh, just uh, not just the training because um, in reality is uh, the only person who should be responsible for doing uh, a cholecystectomy is a consultant and not a registrar. A registrar can be doing it, but it's under uh, the consultant and the consultant should train the registrar in doing the correct way of doing it. Um, and that's a system problem. Um, you can just uh, have a trainee do two cholecystectomies and just he can do them i think he can but i don't i think they're gonna run into problems no matter no matter how excellent you are you are going to have some bile duct problems now the answer to the second part which i thought was pretty intriguing and it seems that you know i've uh, and I grew up in Sudan and I went to medical school for Sudan and I worked a little bit but um, but it seems that I forgot there is uh, the 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 comment about uh, the taboo. Um, uh, I I forgot that the for there is this culture uh, among doctors in Sudan on going behind each other's back, which is something I don't know where that came from. Um, the all. Uh, and I think that that plays a role um, because whoever has a bile duct injury probably doesn't want to show that up so that, you know, doesn't want, want to hide it. And so that um, 
he doesn't get accused or or mocked or anything or or lose business because he's known to have a biotech injury which is uh, which is very dangerous uh, culture if uh, if i may i don't think there's any shame in in somebody undergoing an operation rec- recognizing that he has a problem to call for help or or uh, or do the right thing and, and close the patient and 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 refer the patient and call listen i have a bile duct injury you know the outcome of that patient is going to be much better than if you ignore it or if you try to uh, fix it uh, by, by yourself as i have shown uh, so this is all cultural and system problems in Sudan that, that are very difficult to uh, to uh, fix. That's my my impression about from what you've said. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Akod. Uh, we still have a lot of questions to answer. I know we are focusing on the verbal questions, but we're going to come to the written ones too. Uh, I think Dr. Osman um, is now raising his hand. So go ahead, please unmute yourself when you can talk. Uh, sorry, again, it's not a question, it's a comment. Uh, first of all, I just want to comment on the uh, Bushra's uh, um, question about the, 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 the placement of the stent uh, in the common tangential injury of the common bile duct. I think from what most of us have seen, they always try to go above the injury. And I think that in, uh, in addition to decreasing the pressure in the common bile duct, also allow better healing. Yeah, it can be complicated by stricture, but you know, as Dr. Akot say, you can always go and do dilatation later on. We, I think they are trying to mimic or do what we use. You remember when you use a T-tube, you always go the two limbs, one above and below the injury. So I think, I, I personally think, you know, a stent going above the injury will be a better option. The other thing uh, uh, to answer to the other people about what to do open. I remember when I was training was when as an intern in Khartoum, uh, Khartoum field, a while it is in art. I used to work with consultant. They did lab, uh, they did open cholecystectomy in 15 minutes. I was just amazed how they in and out 15 minutes, which is <laughs> is better than lab calling now. But anyway, I think we have to stress the fact that the Turaq would say, whoever you're doing it open lab, still you have to be careful, know the anatomy. Just be very, 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 uh, have a loss threshold to open, put a drain. And again, the question of IR drain is, if you don't have an IR drain, you know, go sometimes in acute cholecystitis, you find an high drops or a gallbladder very dilated. Open it, put a Foley catheter, simple. Put a Foley catheter inside the gallbladder and just put it back and put a drain outside. Uh, still, this is a problem, as Dr. Akot say, it's a, a problem of a system, a problem. I think we, the, our consultant, Dr. Omar Farouk, Bushra, everybody, I think everybody should just, Education, the registrar should be, you know, educated and should be taught or trained very well. This is a serious, serious issue. I don't know. We, we can help if uh, I'm sure Dr. Accord, we can help if we can come and, uh, you know, workshop or whatever we can help uh, with, we can do that. But yeah, it is, again, education, training. And, uh, and I, and I agree with uh, Usman. I, I, I think uh, I think I think there has to be. That's why I, I, I put that uh, that uh, statement from the sages, uh, creating a culture of safety and uh, education for the trainees and the, for the surgeons. I think, I think it's the responsibility that people should take. These are not, we, we, I'm, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure that uh, you guys in Sudan see this all the time, but we're talking about a serious issue here. Like, you know, you do a cholesterol, an open cholecystectomy, you can do it in 15 minutes, but, um, also, you have to know the anatomy. You have to do it safely, like Osman has said. Um, and quite frankly, I don't think that um, that doing something fast is is good or bad. Um, as long as you do it well and the patients do well, I don't care how long it takes you to do it. Um, and uh, and if you run into a problem, you're not a bad surgeon. Uh, every surgeon I know of. And the most talented surgeons that I have ever seen 
had the most horrible complications. Uh, so it will happen as long as you are doing surgery and um, doesn't mean you are a bad surgeon, uh, but how you react to it is what's gonna decide um, the outcome of the patient. And I think that a culture of safety for the patients has to be the top and not just, you know, you know I'm just, you know, this uh, with huge ego, I go, I do a lap coli in 15 minutes and, you know, I'm, that's, that's how you end up into a lot of trouble. That's what I learned. Thank you very much, Mr. Akot. I'm just gonna uh, reflect on this um, as a junior surgeon. Um, the, the question is also, is open really safer than laparoscopic? I'm talking about the current um, era. Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, talking about the current era with the, at least in the United States with the current training um, as, as um, junior surgeon, we got way more exposed to laparoscopic cholecystectomy compared to open. Um, I still like in the very difficult gallbladder feel more comfortable taking it laparoscopically than open, even if I need to do different maneuvers and talk down. Um, it used to be in my first year of training, a case of uh, maybe the, the second year or third year resident, even a second year at the end of their year. But in one of my programs that I've been to, interns were doing their gallbladder as a master and it's six months after training. So right now we have, it's all a culture, it's all of what's going on, knowing that, okay, that the old thing about, okay, you couldn't do it laparoscopically, go open, yes, that still applied to a lot of things with adhesions and other aspects, but the, the technical part of it is what's also you're comfortable with. And I think with the current era, with the laparoscopic surgeries being uh, widely more used than open, uh, that's a question that uh, might be worth your restudying. Um, I'm gonna, go ahead, Mr. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I I agree with you, but but the question in Sudan is where where it's not as um, widely right. available and and the training is not widely um, uh, available and uh, the technique is not there in some of hospitals. So what people do? That's. The... I think this is a good opportunity to. Um try to come up later again with how we can enhance that in, in safe settings like dry labs or, or simulation labs and stuff like that. And I think that's something that you, Mr. Arcode, was uh, trying to work on and um, establishing a similar simulation center with, with um, uh, other surgeons and other physicians from your batch. Yes. Um, I'm gonna move ahead to some of the written questions before we go back to the verbal, just because we have piling up questions here. Uh, um, there is a question uh, from Dr. Salah Ahmad, who's a gastroenterologist, reflecting on Dr. Busher's point earlier. He was asking if uh, there is a role of intraoperative ERCP and EUS to help with difficult um, lab colleagues. Is our code? Maybe Rasmus can uh, address that, but I've never really um, seen a role for an intraoperative uh, ERCP or EUS, um, I think that th th because there is, um, you can access the bile ducts through the cystic duct, uh, people can do an intraoperative uh, cholangiogram. So, um, and there's no urgency in, if there's something, there's no urgency on, on uh, fixing it intraoperatively. Um, I do not know of a role for uh, ERCP or EUS in, um, in laparoscopic cholecystectomy. I'm not aware of that. Okay, great. And then um, there's also uh, a comment and a question from Dr. Muhammad Layan. I think uh, he's from Libya, as far as I understand. And he was um, commenting just to mention the role of identification of the um, Rovier sulcus during the dissection. And also he was asking, uh, what is the subtotal cholecystectomy just for more clarification on that. So the um, subtotal cholecystectomy is a term referred to um, uh, removing the gallbladder down to the neck, not necessarily taking the whole gallbladder um, or even sometimes leaving the neck, uh, something that would not uh, have you go all the way to the cystic duct to uh, remove the uh, 
um, to ligate the cystic because uh, close cystectomy, you have to go to the cystic duct, uh, ligate the cystic duct, ligate the cystic artery, remove the whole gallbladder. In difficult cases, subtotal cholecystectomies um, are done um, so that you don't have to go all the way to the cystic duct because there are adhesions, there's inflammation, and you can delineate the anatomy. So you remove that part of the gallbladder and, um, and you come out. And that's the subtotal cholecystectomy. You're not removing the whole gallbladder. And uh, people know that these, these are usually the difficult thick wall gallbladder, inflamed, bleeding. So you just remove that part of the gallbladder and uh, you put a drain and you come out. Great. And he was also referring to uh, Rovier sulcus, which uh, I believe we can point it uh, to end in, um, in one of the images where you have that sulcus on the um, right lower side of the gallbladder foss um, on the liver that can yeah. technically be used um, um, to hopefully help uh, making the dissection safer, yeah. not going below that sulcus. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, there was also a question uh, about um, just a technical problem. One of the uh, anonymous attendees was asking how many um, cholecystectomies should I do before I can do it without supervision? I think he was asking about the learning curve. He didn't specify lab, but I'm assuming he's referring to laparoscopic cholecystectomies. Um, any data or any point specifically about that, Mr. Arco? I mean, as, as you know, Akram and, uh, and surgeons know that this varies from one individual to the other and varies from one institution to the other and from one country. There's no set number of surgeries that you can perform um, before you go without uh, supervision. But... Um, uh, I think that even when you are comfortable doing it um, by yourself, uh, and again, this is sometimes um, if there's no structured training, if you do it and you're comfortable doing it, the first probably six months, I would say, always have some senior person with you. Um, not maybe not maybe scrubbing the first maybe not scrub maybe just just watch you just be there you know to help um i can't stress enough the importance of having a senior um uh help and uh, uh that can provide help uh during uh, these procedures what i want people to know is um don't be cowboys and try to think that you can do any operation and you can do cholecystectomy after you do two. There's no set number. I think it's all a level of comfort. Great. A couple more questions. Um, uh, Dr. Ala Musa, uh, she's a general surgeon in Sudan, as far as I understand. Uh, um, she's asking at the time of the operation uh, and a complete injury happens, whether the common bile duct or the common hepatic duct. Does the diameter of the duct um, change uh, the decision of timing of the repair. That's one question. The second question is, uh, if we have a thin common bile duct completely severed and the surgeon having no experience in biliary repair, um, ligating the severed proximal end, does that, is, that a, is there a role for that? By that, making it easier for repair to be done in a wider biliary system. I think she's referring, it's yeah. reflecting the same thing, the diameter and whether it should ligate to make the diameter bigger with more dissension. Yeah, so uh, from my experience repairing bile duct injuries, it really doesn't matter. Um, I, um, the problem with ligating the proximal duct uh, is uh, you don't know when that repair is going to happen. And uh, that would result obviously in jaundice and um, um, possibility of cholangitis. I would not, if you recognize this injury, don't ligate it, just place a drain. Uh, it won't matter what the size of the duct is. You can always do a rule to a, sm a very small duct. You can do a, a nice rule and um, and repair and uh, repair it. I do not um, recommend that the proximal duct uh, be ligated to make it dilate and make the anastomosis easier, because that would result in jaundice for sure. 
What about like the decision in general without like aiding? I mean, like if it was reported that the duct was very small uh, or if it was clipped um, accidentally, like the case you showed, would you wait or is it the decision just based on the timing that the injury was recognized? It all depends on the timing. If it is clipped and then you recognize it, just send them, we'll take them uh, to the OR. But if you recognize that it's already injured, I wouldn't go back and clip it because you may make it worse. Just leave it. Um, uh, what ends up happening is when we look at these, we always don't do the anastomosis at the, at the severed edge because that is usually devascularized. We go up a millimeter or two to a fresh area to do the anastomosis anyway. So it wouldn't matter. One more written question before we go to the verbal ones and we're gonna try uh, to kind of make it short because uh, we're having the two hours. Um, um, Dr. Muhammad Ahmad Omar is asking, can you repeat the technique of the ruin Y hepatic over the stent? And specifically, what is the fate of the stent? Okay, so, uh, okay, that's, that's a good, uh, I can go and show the video again because uh, that shows. So the fate of the, um, of the stent is, uh, it goes, the stent goes, uh, stays for six weeks, uh, and after six weeks, you can just pull it out. So the stent comes out through the skin. Yeah, this is the video. So the technique is, um, this is the, this is a rule limb. And uh, this is a five French pediatric feeding tube that I use um, to do the anastomosis. So that's the bile duct over here. And you see, it's not really a big bile duct. This is a left duct, but so I take a, a suture on the intestine and a suture on the bile duct. So you can see um, this is how the anastomosis is done, posterior layer, um, and then and then the posterior layer of the bile duct. Um, this is the technique. I'm sorry, I, I kind of moved. Um, but what ends up uh, happening is uh, after after you're done. I bring the end of the tube outside and connect it to a, a bile bag. And um, after uh, the cholangiogram, which I do in three days, I cap it. I cap that biliary stent and it stays there. It stays there. You know, this is a biliary, uh, you know how I sutured it in place with a absorbable suture. That usually comes out, you know, dissolving around six weeks. So in six weeks, I just pull the, the stent out and the patient goes, um, that usually doesn't have any issues. Great, okay. Uh, I think we had uh, Dr. Mamoun um, Nabri earlier, he was raising his hand. So um, if you would like, I'm just gonna open an opportunity for you. Go ahead, just please unmute yourself first. Hello everyone, how are you? Doing good. Go ahead. Alhamdulillah, thank you very much. I uh, actually just uh, wanna have a comment. I'm really proud of uh, all this activity run by Sudanese Surgical Club. Uh, my uh, greeting to Mohammed Akot, Osman Saleh, Omar Al Farouk, Nader Hilal, Mohammed Abbas, Akram, and all these guys, and Prof. Rashid, uh, for running these activities, educating our juniors and uh, bridging uh, the gaps and uh, regarding training, educational. And just I want to echo my colleagues, if you have difficult call pleather, just spell out or call for help. This is uh, what we need to do. Uh, and thank you very much for everyone participating in this activity. Thank you. Thank you, Mamun. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'm going to go. Uh, we have uh, two raised hands, Dr. Hassan and Dr. Omar al Farouk. So uh, Dr. Hassan Ahmed, uh, he's also with us in the United States. You can go ahead. Just remember to unmute yourself. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Wallahi, uh, outstanding talk, yeah, Mr. Akut, can I add that? Thank you. And this is, I have a comment to say here about the topic. First thing, I wrote it in English, so I can't say the word. 
آه لما تمشي العمليه نو ذا بري اب ايمجينج ديامترز يعني انت مشيت العمليه للاب كولي ولا اوبن كولي تكون عارف الاسيستيك دكت حجمه كم والكومن بال دكت حجمه كم وذيس از يوجولي دون باي سمبل الترا ساوند عشان لو لقيت في اي ديسباريتيز بعدين لما فتحتها ولا عملت الابسكوبيك الاسيستيك شكله اكبر من الالترا ساوند يو شود باز بيفور يو بروسيد سو نوينج ذا بري اب ايمجينج از فيري فيري هيلفول الحياة الثانية إنه لو إنت ريكوجنايز ذا إنجري هنا إتس تايم فور يور إيجو تو جو أوت سايد ذا ويندو ما في أي إيجو هنا الموضوع كله موضوع عيان تحت إيدك عايزه يكون سليم ومعافى اعتبر واحد من أهلك uh, ما موضوع لا أنا حكمله حصلحها لا go for help إذا عندك help في الانستيشن حقتك ذاتها ذاتس أوكي okay. وما عندك help التليفون اتصل به أي زول في أي حتة في العالم Uh, about what to do next. Uh, describe the situation that you have. There are many times, Dr. Akkot, you said that if you don't recognize the injury at the time, stop there, don't try to proceed. You say, I'll finish the cross-stectomy, and then I'll try to solve the injury. If you recognize the injury, most likely you don't know the rest of the anatomy. So stop there, drain, and call, and send. موسو uh, موسو في بقول لك ما تكمل الكوليستكت بس العيان كما هو uh, بالحاله اللي هو فيها بعدك ذا ذا كان فينيش اب الكوليستكت الا لو كانت جانجرينس ومنتهيه يو كان جست بوت ا درين انتو ات اند كول ذا داي وحول العيان uh, الحاجه الاخيره اللي اقولها اللي هو ذا ريسيفنج سيرجون الهيباتيبيلي ريسيرجون اللي بتجي الحاله دي uh, الجول اول حاجه انك انت كنترول السبسس um, بتاع العيان لانه ده اللي بيقتل العيان زي ما قال مستر عقود ما موضوع انك انت تو فيكس ذا انجري كنترول السبسس اند يو هاف تو نو ذا اكستنت اوف ذا انجري سبيشلي ذا فاسكولار انجري ما داير تمشي تصلح لك بايل دكت والعيان ينتهي ب رايت ليفر نكروسيس لانه انت ما عارف الرايت هيباتيك ارتري حصل فيه شنو ذيس از اولسو يعني فيري فيري امبورتنت اي ثينك ذيس از اوريدي سين multiple times they fix the artery لانه بعد ذاك المشكله كلها حتكون مشكله لك انت الهيباتيبيلي سيرجري او السينيور سيرجون صلحتها البال دكت انجري اند يو ميست ذا فاسكولار انجري سو اتس ايكولي امبورتنت تو نو ذا اكستنت اوف ذا فاسكولار انجري اند ايمجينج يوجولي هيلبس ولا سي تي سكان ولا دوبلر التر سان ولا اي حاجه ويل هيلب يو بيفور يو بروسيد بس تعليقات بسيطه يعني شكرا جزيلا ثانك يو فيري ماتش Hold on, Mr. Akhud. Any comments? No, no, no. I just wanted to thank Hassan um, for uh, his comments. All right. Uh, we're going to go then to uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Amar Farooq again. Um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I think that we agree that Uh, training is very important, especially in Sudan here for, for our junior, uh, the registrar or junior surgeons. Uh, there is a very valid point that in a training is structured and an animal simulation lab. Already we started to build a simulation lab or animal lab at Soba University Hospital. I could work with the الدفعة بتاعتنا شغالة فيه وأنا ماسك البروجكت ده في سوبا ونحن هسا قطعنا فيو شوت وي هاف ذا بيلدينج وإيفري ثينج لكن محتاجين سبورت من من برا أي ثينك الليلة دي هايلايت إنه نحن وي ديفينتلي نيد تو بيلد أور أنيمال لاب والسيميوليشن لاب أساس الريجسترار ديل نوت تو جو أن ترين إن ريال بيشنتس Uh, uh, for it is a high, high time in the study to work seriously towards this aim. Well, and I think in uh, the American society, uh, I hope in the next few years, 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 I hope the next few years, Uh, and then I'm building okay, the, like in the room, but get a proper support. Yeah, 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 yeah Omer, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm actually pushing that project through the mm-hmm. SAPA surgery. Um, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
very yes, good. Very good. Akram knows about the uh, uh, very good. Uh, very good. I think it is. Uh, بعد كده محتاجين نكون يعني نشتغل فيه شغل كويس خاصه بعد ما نغدي والله الحقيقه اي ثينك اتس ا برايورتي بت ايفري تايم اباوت ذات السودان جيتس ويز سمثينج ايوه 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 لكن ان شاء الله هسه الى غادي اتفتحت ايوه صح يو ار رايت يو ار رايت اند ذن الفيضانات ايفري تايم Uh, like inshallah we, we but, have to push uh, i agree with you uh, yeah, i i think it's yeah, very yeah. very important that's right that's right uh, very good thank you very much thank you very much i think no akhirna alayk kathir nahna wa ala jamaa kulluhum ya ma inda ayi haja guys ma inda ayi haja christmas day there is nothing going on <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much inshallah i would like also uh, we have also prof sulaiman hussain from sudan uh, with us here i would like to um, invite him to uh, jump in and comment or, or um, give us his um, expertise and, and, and the points here. So, uh, Prof. Suleiman, if you're available, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and talk. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. You hear me? Yes, yeah. we hear you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Akkod wa Akram. I really, I really, uh, as usual, I could enjoy your talk. And I think this is a positive side of COVID that it allowed that uh, experience transfer rather than to, uh, fly across the Atlantic. It's just we across our fingertips just to exchange the experience. Thank you very much. And I think that uh, I, you covered most of what we want to talk about, starting from prevention. And I think the situation here in Sudan, this is where we should concentrate on. And I had uh, Omar talked uh, just a minute ago about the impact of training. We are, uh, uh, we are having a, co a collapsed health system. Let us agree to this. And we are now seeing in Sudan trying our best to rebuild the health system. And I think the, what is uh, common body engineering is just one of the one of the manifestation of this collapse. But I think in terms of training, in terms of number of registrars, in terms of health services, a lot. We have, I think there's a lot ahead of us to work hard on it to bring it to the surface. Uh, coming back to the, to, to the, to the problem of common biologic injury, and uh, even before the era of laparoscopic restricted, I think that uh, common biologic injury are the distinct complication of even open cholestectomy. And, but I agree that with the era of laparoscopic cholestectomy, with the endeavor of everybody want to put a scope in and to take the gold bladder out, the incidence is rising. Um, I, what I do feel from my experience is that usually combined duct injury start before the surgery. When you fail to select the right patient and uh, Patients now, it is not an indication that everybody with an ultrasound report showing multiple gold stones or solitary gold stones, you should have surgery. And uh, this unfortunate is happening everywhere now. We are not pay operating on patients, we are operating on ultrasound reports. And most of the time, the patient is either asymptomatic or he's having symptoms due to other GIT pathology. And the heavy price of that for an asymptomatic gold stones, he will end with having a devastating common bile duct injury. And then of course you have to, uh, I like uh, just the last comment about the preoperative assessment. Is that when you do your liver function test, you have a higher calcium phosphate and I'm, what I'm saying this because I know there is a, our junior colleagues are uh, most of the uh, attendance of this webinar. And I think that's something we should, we should ignore, a high alkaline phosphate is. Just a single test. You should just you have to think carefully. This is um, um, uh, this is probably a marker of an impending difficult cholestectomy. It is either a small contracted gallbladder or it could be hiding a very tiny small in the even if the serum bilirubin is normal. So a proper assessment uh, before surgery and the ultrasound we have to have uh, ultrasound is operator dependent and uh, the first thing when i have an ultrasound i look at the head of the paper to see where is it coming from and i add i like the comment that we have to 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 read it carefully 
and because he's a good predictor of the difficulty of cholecystectomy, which is most likely, as we know, that uh, injuries are more common with difficult cholecystectomies. Although, yes, they do care with straightforward cholecystectomies, but it's still the difficult ones are the ones which are injured fairies. So I think good reading for the, for the ultrasound having a good confidence on who did the ultrasound, the sickness of the gallbladder, contract of the gallbladder, et cetera, the size of the common bile. So, and the other thing, when I, I, another uh, problem, which you probably are not facing across the Atlantic there. I think here we have to, when you take the patient to the theater, I think you are the one who will be responsible for the whole system. So you should have a good uh, support who is going to help me? Not every scrub nurse can help you in a lab coli. Very few are trained to, to help in lab colis. Who is going to hold the camera for me? It is not everybody buy a thing by you, just give him a hand and he can hold the camera. So I see the, most of the time that you find that is the frustration during the operation, which makes some, you see some visual hallucinations that the camera is not working, the focusing is not right, the sucker is not working, you are not having the right instrument. These probably are not facing this, uh, except in Sudan here. So here you have to make sure of the setup before you start the operation. Make sure everything is functioning. Make sure that the light source is good. Make sure that the sucker is working. Make sure that the assignment is working. Make the right setup. You will be the whole you will be the more responsible of you having got any technical support in the operation. You will be the engineer, you will be the attendant, you will be the, the one who is selecting the instrument. You would, sometimes you have to hold the camera as well as doing the procedure. So make sure you are having the right setup. Make sure that the a functioning laboratory, uh, laparoscopy uh, tower. Make sure of the assistance. Make sure of who is going to hold the camera for you. The other point, when you go in, when I usually I tell my colleague or my junior that the fairest look is a diagnostic look. I agree with Omar. If you find it, then you ask yourself, uh, the fairest look is a gallbladder, mass, everything is matted together and so on. Uh, am I be able to proceed? Don't you start fiddling. If from the start you think that this is a difficult gallbladder and the danger risk of fistulating bowel or the risk of bleeding is high, I think that you have to make sure, am I having a backup if anything happened? Who is doing another distanciator? Who is available? Who is not available? And this will justify your decision either to proceed or not. So I think these are the factors which are very important, which you have to consider before you proceed. And as uh, I could say, all through the early detection, early detection, of course, most of our patients here or lab colleagues are not doing that the day case, but most of the time they stay overnight in the hospital. And what I am saying that is that if you come next morning and the patient is not sitting up, had a shower, had a breakfast, asymptomatic, this is the right patient I think you send home. But if the patient doesn't look well, Ayana Ragdef is serious, she doesn't look right, she has some dyspeptic symptoms or whatever, vital sign there is a bit of taking there, he will have to think why that is most likely there is something serious going on. So I think that selection of patients and early detection are very, very important in, in uh, either preventing the injury or uh, early detection and early treatment with the long-term outcome, with a good, uh, good uh, outcome. Uh, just one question, uh, a quote about subtotal cholecystectomy. Uh, here come to the comment that we in Sudan where portal hypertension is common and sometimes uh, they present with goalie stones and we have had some patients whom usually they bleed massively from the gallbladder bed. And uh, what we are doing here, probably rather than doing a, sub, a complete subtotal cholecystectomy, you leave the posterior wall of the gallbladder intact and probably you dysermize it or whatever. And then, uh, you, because if you remove the whole bladder, I think some, most of the time those erotic livers or fibrotic will harm their liver, they bleed massively. So I think this is another variant of, variant of uh, subtotal cholecystectomy where you leave the posterior wall of the gallbladder. But uh, I think there is a lot to talk about, but you talked about, uh, you read many questions and answered the uh, accord. And thank you very much. And I think that is very beneficial even for us, for our, and for our, my colleagues, juniors, as well as seniors. Shukran Jazeera, Akkord, Shukran Akram.
thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Suleiman. Uh, Mr. Suleiman, um, he taught all of us surgery and we are in uh, debt to him uh, for his uh, service to the surgery in Sudan. Uh, you made very, very important uh, and good points um, about the setup and um, and uh, and the help and who is helping you and and whether the operation. I think these are very, very crucial points that you made. Um, and uh, regarding the uh, leaving, the, that's uh, that's one of the ways of doing the, the subtural cholecystectomy, which is totally fine uh, to leave the posterior wall of the gallbladder, or at least part of it, um, to prevent uh, massive uh, massive uh, bleeding in uh, cirrhotic patients. Um, so that's that's well uh, well uh, received. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Suleiman and Dr. Akkad. I think I had uh, I had uh, Dr. Mahmoun earlier who was raising hands. I'm going to take just two more opportunities, then we'll have to stop after. Um, Dr. Mahmoun, go ahead. You can uh, unmute yourself and talk if you would like to. Hey, yeah, actually, actually, my question was answered. And uh, going back again to the training, Omar Farouk said uh, Soba is preparing the lab, uh, wet lab. Um, 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 as a, a trauma surgeon, surgical critical care, I'm ready to bring the atom course to Sudan as soon as this lab is ready and uh, uh, without any uh, problem. So uh, we'll liaise with Dr. Umar and Dr. Suleiman so we can uh, get this course in Sudan. Uh, this is uh, advanced uh, uh, operative trauma management and it is done in a live uh, animal. It uh, will be a good opportunity for Sergio in Sudan to have this course. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is uh, definitely great. And I think gathering like this with such opportunities opening up, bring us all to uh, the, the point and help us all like, kind of decide how we can uh, chip in and jump to help with, with such issues. Uh, so thank you again for that. I'm gonna then move to Dr. Hassan. And that's, uh, this will be the last opportunity to participate since we are hitting uh, two hours and 20 minutes now. So Dr. Hassan, you can go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. I'll give you all the details. The first thing I'll say is that the first thing is that the surgery is indicated. Because karma goes along. If the body is not needed for the surgery, there is a big chance that you'll get to 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 get فما يعني عنده جوستونز معناها تشيله. آه الحاجه الثانيه ال ال في في سي في بيبرز آه في اثنين ولا ثلاثه عن فنستريتد كولستكتومي آه اللي هو دي تو ايكو مستر سليمان ال يو كان ريموف الانتيرير وول تخلي البوستيرير وول وممكن تمشي از يعني تورز ذا نيك از ماتش از باسبل يعني لحد ما تحس ان انت خلاص انا بعد قربت من الدينجر زون وتجيف على كده. Uh, you don't have to close it. لانه السيستيك دارك موست اوف ذا تايم از اوبليتريتد عشان كده حصلت له المشاكل دي كلها. You can just leave a drain. Uh, والدرين ده بعد فتره will, will come out. Most likely uh, it will cause. في في سيريز بتاع بيبر بتاع just to do في نستريت جوبر اللي هو انت ما ما ملزم انك تقفل الجوبر بعد ما ما تشيل منها ذا موست بارت تطلع على الستونز والانتيريور وول وكده. It's all about safety. It's, uh, it, uh, you always ask yourself in every surgery when you're having difficulties, why are you there to do what? What's the goal? Uh, and then act uh, towards it yani, as much as you can. To achieve your goal is that that high high food danger that I am, it can admitted multiple times or multiple operations. Okay, حتى الأرواح وايد ما ما they're not with their own risks يعني they can also stricture they can have cholangitis. ده كله ممكن يحصل لهم بعد ذاك يعني. فا always did you need did you need to be there in the first place and then how how can you achieve your goal safely? This my two cents for this. شكرا جزيلا. 
Yeah, these are uh, great points, uh, Hassan. I agree with you. You have to ask why the patient needs a cholecystectomy. I personally don't do uh, a lot of cholecystectomies. I rarely do cholecystectomies, as I said, uh, I, I, because the general surgeons won't even give us cholecystectomies to do because they, and you know, we're busy with other stuff. But uh, but my uh, my take is uh, the first. The first episode of biliary colic is not an indication for uh, cholecystectomy. Uh, like somebody comes in with abdominal pain and they ha don't have cholecystitis and they have just abdominal pain and they found they have stones, some stones in the gallbladder. I don't know if that's really an indication for cholecystectomy. Um, and, uh, and again, like Hassan said, I think that's a very good point. Does that patient need the operation and why? Uh, that's very important to ask yourself. Um, it's not just, you know, I can do anything. Like I'm a surgeon, I can do a cholecystectomy. And um, if they end up with a, with a problem, you're right. Even one why hypericogigenostomy can stretch and uh, patients can may need dilatation, may need another operation. So um, it's not without its complications neither. So, uh, I agree. You have to ask yourself, does this patient um, first do no harm? Uh, does the patient really need the operation? Thank you, Mr. Akod. Um, th this was definitely a great opportunity, and we had a lot of questions uh, answered everywhere. Uh, but I want to give just one more opportunity for the person really playing a big role behind the scene, uh, Dr. Muhammad Abbas. Uh, he's a registrar of surgery in Sudan, and He's really a kind of one of the founder of the Sudanese Surgical um, Club, and he's been working tirelessly night and day. Uh, I, I've been in contact with him for months, and I sometimes texted him when it was 2, 3 a.m. in Sudan, and he answers me, and I get surprised. Like, he's awake just all time working on this. So thank you very much, Mohammed, for your work. I think you have a question or got a question from somebody, so please feel free to unmute yourself and ask that question. Uh, first of all, thanks very much, Mr. Akram, and thanks, Mr. Akot, for this very elegant uh, talk and very thorough discussion on this very telling topic. Uh, my question regarding outcome of early laparoscopic cholecystectomy: uh, is it standard or from your practice uh, in comparison to uh, elective cholecystectomy? So the question is, uh, cholecystectomy, uh, what do you mean by early cholecystectomy? Like, uh, you mean acute cholecystitis. So, so the recommendation um, from the sages is that for acute cholecystitis within 72 hours, you proceed with cholecystectomy. Um, the chronic cholecystitis, um, there's no sufficient um, data uh, or studies to make uh, any recommendation. But the recommendation for acute cholecystitis, uh, mild acute cholecystitis that is, uh, is to proceed with the cholecystectomy. So somebody presents with um, what you diagnose as mild acute cholecystitis is, there's no problem in, um, in doing uh, cholecystitis cholecystectomy. So I, I, I guess uh, I just want to emphasize here that, that for gallstones, they can either present with biliary colic, that's no inflammation, that's just pain. Um, because the stone is passing through, through the common bile duct or just is stuck in the cystic duct, or they develop acute cholecystitis. And that's a different diagnosis than biliary colic. That's uh, an inflammation that results from obstruction of the cystic duct. And so for biliary colic, I was saying that somebody develop, uh, someone develops a biliary colic. The, usually the first one is not a real indication um, because sometimes it doesn't happen again. Um, but uh, for acute cholecystitis, that's uh, uh, a different story. That's an inflammation. And the recommendation is if you develop acute cholecystitis is to have cholecystectomy, whether you can do that uh, within 72 hours or later um, depends on a lot of factors. But the recommendation from SAGES is that you can go ahead and proceed if it's mild acute cholecystitis. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Akhod. 
thank you everyone who um, participated or joined today uh, in this session uh, that was very rich in information and different aspects related to um, bile duct injury and the associated vascular injury that happens during or after uh, during cholecystectomy and how we can manage it. Uh, thank you very much to uh, our speaker today, Dr. Muhammad Akod. Thank you to Muhammad Abbas uh, who helped coordinating this. Uh, thank you to all our attendees and uh, participants, um, uh, consultants, professors, specialists, and registrars who um, came in today and checked in and, and, and uh, endured with us those two and a half hours of rich information. Um, um, just a reminder again that this session is recorded and will be posted on the SAP Academic Facebook page and will also be posted on the different Sudanese surgical club groups uh, through Muhammad Abbas. I uh, appreciate um, all the attendance and uh, uh, we wish you all happy. Um, have a good day and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Thank you.